This week on The Anxious Truth, we have a special guest on the podcast. We have psychologist and author Dr. David Carbonell is back on the show. We're going to talk about panic attacks, how Dave approaches them in his practice and with his clients. And we're going to talk about the second edition of his book, The Panic Attack Workbook. So let's get going. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 202 in March of 2022. Uh, today on the podcast, we have psychologist and author and returning guest, Dr. David Carbonell from Chicago. Uh, Dave is pretty much a legend in the anxiety community. I'm fortunate to have him on again today. Uh, Dave has been practicing in Chicago with many, many clients over many, many years. He's the author of quite a few very well-known and well-respected books on the topic of anxiety disorders and recovery. And today we're going to talk specifically about his approach to panic attacks. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the second edition of his book, the panic attacks workbook, which you guys know that I am not about endorsing books and products, but the panic attacks workbook is really a good resource. So I don't mind talking about this one at all. Uh, and that's it. So I had Dave on, we did a little zoom interview a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to cut to that quickly. And then uh, I will wrap it up at the end. As usual, before we get started, I will just very quick reminder that the anxious truth is more than just podcast at this podcast episode. If you're unfamiliar with what I've got going on here and all the information that surrounds the podcast, just head on over to the anxious truth.com to find all the rest of the episodes, my books and my morning newsletter and all my free social media content. So go check that out. But uh, I don't want to spend much time on that. I really want to get to the interview. It was great. I think you guys are going to dig it. And uh, yeah, here's Dave Carbonell talking about panic attacks. And I will come back at the end to wrap it up like we usually do. David Carbonell, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about this. The Panic Attacks Workbook, which is, this is a new edition. You've rewritten it and updated it. And I, I noticed a very clear reference to streaming horror movies, which might not have been in the first in the first <laughs> version of the book. You know, the first version came out in 04. Uh, so I, I don't think we were doing any streaming then. No, probably not. And when I read that, I said, okay, clearly, this is clearly an updated version of the book. So let's talk about it. The Panic Attacks Workbook. What is it? You tell me what it is. And I'm going to tell then I'm going to tell you what I think I got out of reading it. And Dave, by the way, was gracious enough to send me an advanced review. So I have read the book. I've been through it. Um, well, th this is a book for people who are uh, who experience panic attacks in, in a variety of circumstances. Maybe they have full blown panic disorder and agoraphobia. Uh, maybe they just panic in very select situations like, like public speaking, or they worry about nervous sweating uh, or vomiting. Um, but th this is a book for people who are, who are struggling with panic attacks and, and trying to find out uh, what do I have to do to get over this? Uh, somebody please coach me on what are the steps? What is the approach? How, how can I, uh, fix this area of my life. Uh, so it's, it's as much as I could write it, a step-by-step -step approach, here's what to do. Yeah, I, I think as opposed to just talking about it, which, and there's a ton of books I, I wrote mm -hmm. that talk about it. And I tried to do the step-by-step -step approach thing when I, when I wrote The Anxious Truth, but really and truly people keep asking me to write a workbook and you did. So really Dave's workbook is, is if for those of you who are listen to the podcast regularly, have read my, my work, this this workbook is kind of the workbook that would go along with the anxious truth. So I love how you you're not just talking about this problem, but you're stepping people through. Did you kind of write it as if you were this is as close as I could get to being in a therapy room with you without actually being in a therapy room? Was that part of the, what you were after? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I wanted the book to read like uh, a session in my office. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's where I got all, all the material and the ideas. I, you know, I, uh, I learned that from my clients over the years, really. So it's, it's very much a slice of life of this is what we, we do, uh, in the office. If, if yeah. you, you came this evening, let's talk about that. Like I've learned from my clients over the years. So this is an approach what, what's in the workbook it was clearly informed, not only by what, you know, but probably what's come back to you in the, by way of feedback. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you could tell when you're writing, there's a bunch of stuff in there. And it's a great book. The specific fears that you addressed in the book are the same questions you guys that are listening, the questions you ask me all the time. But what about this? But what about DPDR? But what about this? I'm guessing that the reason why you included those specific fears is because of the feedback you've gotten over the years dealing with your clients. Yes, yeah. One of the, the major updates of the book is uh, I, I have a whole bunch of new chapters on topics that the, the first one didn't cover. 
uh, nervous sweating, depersonalization, uh, nocturnal panic, yeah. um, emetophobia, fear of vomiting. Uh, uh, th these are issues that it only became clear to me in my practice. Uh, many more people struggling with this and, and, and needing very specific help to those functional areas. So there, there's a whole bunch of, of new chapters on, on those very specific kind of fears. Yeah, uh, then that makes a lot of sense. I could tell you that in the community around the podcast, DPDR, nocturnal panic, and emetophobia are huge themes that I would have never thought I'd be addressing, but yet here we are. So I love that you included those and, and, and tried to, yeah, and I think tried to, to, to apply like the steps that I've walked you through in this book. Here's how you might apply them in those instances, which was great. I think sometimes, you know, when people are really focused on, say, a fear of vomiting or, or a fear of sweating, uh, it's easy to not recognize, well, that act that's actually a very specific application of panic disorder. And, yeah. and if you can see how to apply it, we can treat it in much the same way. Uh, so that, that was the, 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 the leap I wanted to try and bridge there. People often don't recognize, you know, how that is a subset of panic disorder. And, and that's what I wanted to show them. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So you really went through that. The, the thing that I really dig about this, we could, I want to talk about discomfort, not equaling danger in a second. But making no mistake that this really is a workbook. So, but the thing that I dig about it, and let's touch on this for a second before we move on would be, you're not only just, this is not just instructive. There's a bunch of psychoeducation that goes before the exercises. How important is that? You can't just, can't just write a book that says, do this, this, and this without telling people why they're doing it. Right, right. Well, I, th I think that's essential. Uh, the, the, the trick is to not make the, the education so onerous and, and, and so, uh, so lengthy as to leave people thinking, oh my God, when is he going to tell me what the steps are? Yeah. Uh, so I, I worked very hard to, to get that in and, and make it fairly digestible. But uh, certainly the, the steps without any of that, um, you know, might have just might just strike somebody as, well, that's a peculiar idea. I don't think I want to do that. Uh, it, it needs some preface. Yeah, it's the why, wait, why am I doing this? I think that's that's critical in this process because it's hard to do scary things if you don't know why you're doing them. Yeah, yeah, and, and basically the psych, a lot of the psychoeducation revolves around the fact that uh, panic disorder and all these related problems uh, are such a paradoxical experience uh, that if you follow your gut instinct about what to do with a panic attack, it's going to make things worse for you. Yeah, uh, and and you really have to go in the opposite direction. You know, I call it the rule of opposites. People have to go in the opposite direction of what their gut instinct is telling them. And, and right there, that, that's probably 70% of the psychoeducation, uh, coming to understand that and, and what makes that true. And yeah. How to use it. And I think it's a big ask when you, so even when people understand that, like, okay, logically, I understand what you're saying finally, but it is difficult to take those first few steps. So the way the book is written, it really kind of takes you from, almost taking the steps in your head first and really conceptualizing it. And there are concrete ways that you can go about thinking about these things. And you give yourself, uh, you give the reader examples. What about times when you thought this, or what about times when you experienced that to lay the foundation in a workbook style before, okay, now let's actually do some things. So as opposed to like do the opposite and now go out and drive to the supermarket by yourself, you really ease them in with some examples of think of a time when you thought this which was really great. Have you found that, did that grow out of your experience with dealing with many clients over the years? Uh, yes, I, I think my experience in the office uh, is that I could much more quickly help people come to grasp the notion of opposites. Uh, we, we might talk, of, you know, and the most frequent way is someone will come in and uh, we'll be sitting face to face and they'll explain to me, well, I have this terrible problem, I can't catch my breath. And, and they might experience that right there in session uh, and boy, then, then we're on the Royal road to fixing this because I'll, I'll be able to ask them, well, sh you know, go ahead, take a deep breath. Now, let me see what you do. And they try and suck it in. And, and then I can ask them, well, what would be the opposite of that? And then we're doing this face to face in real time. And uh, the opposite of that, I don't know, look to my left instead of my right. And we're eventually going to, you know, get to the point where they realize, oh, the opposite of is, yeah. Uh, and now they grasp, wow, it works better when I start with an exhale instead of an inhale. Yeah. Uh, the opposite. And everything else down the line 
is going to follow from that. So when a person comes into my office, we, we can do that and they can have the physical experience of seeing what I'm talking about. In, right. in the book, I had to find ways to offer stories and illustrations and experiments to help them do the same thing, even though they might be 3,000 miles away. Right, and reading at some different time. So that makes sense. It, it really came through and it, it was super useful. So uh, let's talk about the, the one of the things that I think is great. You talked about opposite action. You literally wrote, this is almost right in the introduction of the book, the panic trick brainwashes you into thinking and acting in the exact ways that it will keep it alive, which, I mean, the, again, if you guys have been listening to the podcast, you've heard this again and again and again, but now we have another, I love how you call it a trick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is, have you found that that helps people to sort of, because I find that most people will visualize it as some sort of external enemy monster. Yes, yeah, an opponent, the demon, right. uh, you know, all those natural spontaneous metaphors for it, uh, which have, you know, would have the, the natural result, what those metaphors are going to lead to you, lead you to is fighting, resisting, fleeing. Uh, I either have to fight this off, or I have to run away from it. That's what we do with enemies. We fight them, we run away from them. And if you think of panic as an enemy, you're going to keep doing that and you're going to keep getting tricked into making it worse. So uh, uh, trick was a, a nice metaphor that I, I think helps a lot of people realize, oh, wait a minute here. I'm not going to fall for that. Uh, what's really happening and how can I how can I help my interests rather than feeding into uh, the, this this deception that I'm experiencing? Yeah, the thought that came to mind when I was reading is like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football. Like mm -hmm. he knows she's going to pull it out. Lucy's going to pull it up. He falls for it again and again and again. But that's that's the nature of the, the comic strip. But thinking of panic as Lucy and the football. And uh, I don't know, some of our younger listeners might not get that. But um, I like that much better than this is a war. This is my enemy. This is my adversary is a monster or a demon. Very good. Very, very good. And, and it takes you quite literally in, in much more useful directions than, than the demon metaphor. That, that's always going to betray you. Yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%. One of the things that I really dug too is relax or I'll shoot, which was one of the coolest uh -huh. little passages in the book. Let's talk about relax or I'll shoot. Um, I'll give you guys a little background. So Dave walks you through these scenarios where somebody threatens him, you yourself, using yourself as a subject, which is great. Like somebody walks in your office and says, rearrange all this furniture or I'll kill you. And so you rearrange the furniture, no problem. Uh, to, you know, and it works. You're right. And it works, works just fine. Let's do a couple of little tasks that are easy to do or, or I'll kill you. And he does the task and it works out great. Now the task is relax or I'll kill you. Yeah. And boy, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's no good way out of that one. No, uh, it, but that's a perfect way to describe what's going on when people are attempting to, I must calm this down. That's what you're addressing there. I assume. Yes. Yeah. And, and, uh, no sooner do they have that instinct, that self-talk, I must calm this down. Well, it's already too late. Uh, your heart, your nervous system, your, your fingers, everything is now doing that which will contribute to building and maintaining the panic. Yeah. Uh, because you don't have to calm this down. Uh, you know, long story short, you, you just have to wait and, and let it calm down. Yeah, it'll calm down by uh, and, and when you're trying to, to do that, that's that's what maintains the anxiety. Yeah, calm down or I'll, I'll <laughs> relax or I'll shoot was really brilliant in a way. Um, another thing that you said, uh, you talked through people through a bunch of different things. One of the great questions that you asked, which I think is is indicative of how this book is working, is ask yourself, have you ever had a panic attack that doesn't end? Is a great question in the book because it really speaks to like that distortion. Like, oh, I'm in continuous panic, but are you really? So. That was one great thing that you threw out for sure. And I'm guessing that's, again, another thing that you encounter on a regular basis. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, the, if, if you could uh, listen to a, a broadcast of people's thoughts during a panic attack, uh, the most prevalent, the most persistent is, oh, my God, when's it going to end? What if it doesn't end? How can I make it end? It's all about uh, ending. I have to make this end. And, and they're completely uh, forgetting at that moment. Uh, to be able to draw on their experience that every panic attack they ever had has ended. Uh, when they did everything that most brilliantly, the best possible way to bring it in for a soft landing, when they reacted uh, in all the, the most unhelpful ways and did everything in their fear that might make it last longer, it literally doesn't matter what they did, they all ended regardless. And, yeah. and that's a powerful 
uh, reassurance that people tend to forget. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let's, and I, I'm trying to hit on so many topics here because the book is just chock full of great stuff. I, I, one of the things that you brought out, which I think was fascinating, because I know this is a thing, you know, the chemicals, well, it's chemicals, this is all chemical. One of the greatest statements you made in the book is the question that says, well, how do the chemicals, you know, well, I, I panic in the supermarket because I have chemical, it's a chemicals in my brain. And you asked the question in the book, well, how do the chemicals find out where you are? How, <laughs> yeah. how do they know that you're in this panic place? Let's talk about that for a second. What's the answer to that? Uh, well, well, the, uh, the yeah. answer is that the, the chemicals tell you <laughs> where you are. Yeah. Uh, and how do they tell you that? Well, that's in your own thoughts, uh, that you're telling yourself that. Uh, you know, the, the, the point of the story is to help people realize, gee, this is not a chemical imbalance at all. Chemical, you know, what, what chemicals do in the supermarket, the same thing they do in the drugstore uh, or in the pet shop or, or walking to get my mail. Yeah. Uh, when people have this notion, the chemicals, uh, well, they feel powerless. They, they feel like, you know, they're the hapless victim of what the chemicals happen to do to them. Uh, and so I wanted to use that story to help them come back once again to realize uh, it's, it's uh, the automatic thoughts I'm having, and in particular, how those thoughts guide my actions. That's what's really at stake here in, in determining is the panic going to proceed or is it going to end? Yeah, and the way you walk the reader through that, it, it reminds them like, well, oh, I have agency here. I actually have a role. It's this is not just an out of control biological process. I I contribute here. Got a role to play. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's is a, a hard. That's sometimes a hard statement because it, it almost comes off as sounding like, well, you're this is your fault. No, 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 no. It's not your fault. It's just that we have we play a role in it. So you did it. You did that in a really masterful way, I think, with that question. How do they? Well, that, that's what I like about that you know, that chemicals question. I, I remember the first time that occurred to me, I, I was giving a, a, a talk at a library uh, and, and somebody asked me that question and I just never kind of thought of it in that way before. And I remembered, I just kind of blurted out, well, how do the chemicals find out where you are? And everybody laughed and they, they, they grokked it. They wrecked, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it, it made sense to them on a, on a very intuitive level. Uh, yeah. So I think there's some power in that really. Yeah, it makes sense in a big way. Let's talk about, uh, and we're, we're just kind of we're, we're loping through the book here, but you did a whole chapter, which I think was spectacular because this work that you do and everybody listening to the podcast is familiar with, with this sort of stuff can be really mechanical, dry. It's almost like engineering. And sometimes the resistance is, well, you're taking away the humanity, the compassion, the, the emotions. You did an entire chapter on secrecy and shame, which was, was great. This is, this is an issue that I think often doesn't get talked about enough in conjunction with this cognitive behavioral approach that, that we're talking about. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and what people often don't realize, the, the way I wanted to cast it is, uh, uh, what, well, shame is the feeling and secrecy is, is your response to having that feeling. You, you, you try and mitigate it, you try and hide it. Uh, that, that secrecy is just another safety behavior as much as, as avoidance or, or carrying a support object with you or a safety a safety app of having a safety person with you uh, to come to recognize um, when I feel ashamed and, and try and hide this, that's uh, another one of the safety behaviors that's kind of making me more more subject to panic. And, and so uh, there, there's a dual message here. There's nothing to be ashamed of about this, although people commonly feel that. And even worse, it leads them to get in their own, you know, the way of their own recovery. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think when we don't talk about that, people are, are, are stuck in two bad ways. They, they feel bad and they're encouraged to continue to try and hide this, uh, which makes their recovery more, more difficult as well. Yeah, it's a good chapter. And it does walk you through, again, in workbook style. Remember that everything in the book really is geared toward workbook. So it's, it's you doing some discovery where Dave is kind of guiding you through that, which is really great. You mentioned safety people. You talked about a whole, there's a whole chapter about safety people. And the, the safe person as, which I love, a, a safe, per, safe person as a cheerleader, as a supporter, not a taskmaster, not an accountability partner, not somebody who tells you what to do. Uh, very common problems also. Like, well, I, and you know, one of the great statements you made was, make sure, I think it was right at the end of the chapter. Hey, make sure your safe person actually knows they're your safe person. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so that entire chapter was great too, because I know it's questions that come up a lot in my discussions and when you say 
if you could ever listen to people's thoughts in a panic attack, like I hear them every, I have 35,000 people that tell me their thoughts of panic every day. So you nailed it for sure. Let's talk about the safe person relationship and how that fits into this. What's your, you know, what should a safe person be in your mind? Uh, the, the safe person uh, ought to be support someone person. Who, You support actually call person. support person. Yeah, I, I prefer support person yeah. because they're not making you any safer. Right. Uh, you know, uh, what, what does the support person do? Well, ideally, they just uh, hang out with you. Uh, they go along for the ride. They play second banana. Uh, you know, some of the suggestions I make are, um, you know, the, the support person plays this passive role. Uh, they don't take the wheel. They don't guarantee your safety. They don't continually promise you're going to be okay. Uh, they, they just come along with you. And if there's something you want them to do, they'll wait for you to ask. They don't take over. They don't take initiative on their own. Yeah. Um, because when they do those things, you tend again to lose your own sense of agency and think, well, I'm protected and uh, kept viable by the presence of my support person. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that leads people to feel weaker and more vulnerable over time. Uh, I, ideally, the support person does nothing, uh, really. And, and I talked in, in the chapter about ways to you know fade them out. Well, if they're going with you in the grocery store, have them walk on a parallel aisle. Or, or if you're not ready for that, have them walk six feet behind you. Yeah. Uh, you know, always be looking to fade them out because uh, fade out their presence, because as long as you rely uh, on a support person, uh, that's going to continue to feed your sense of being vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, that's that like protect, I need protection, which you, protection is for danger, not for discomfort is one of the great themes that goes through the book, the difference between discomfort and danger. Um, you can be really afraid, but still safe at the same time, which is kind of where the soul Yeah, goes. and that, that takes some getting used to. I mean, on one hand, we can all kind of recognize that, but people instinctively respond to feeling afraid. Well, if I'm afraid, then I'm in danger. Yeah. Uh, and boom, there's the, there's the trick right there. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Th this leads me to another thing. We're gonna go for maybe another five minutes or so so we don't make this too long. And I appreciate your time today, by the way, is uh, I, if I am afraid, it means my thought tells me this and I am fused to that thought. So you did talk about cognitive diffusion and you, you referenced things like ACT and DBT. Let's talk about that, third, those third wave sort of therapies. How have you had to change over time? And, and I don't, I don't, I will be honest with you, I don't know if those references were in the first version of the book in 04. Uh, you know, they were um, in, in a fairly preliminary way. I, I worked a lot with the notion of acceptance rather than cognitive restructuring in that first book. Uh, yeah. I already moved away from, you know, classical reliance on cognitive restructuring. Um, uh, but they're, they're much more central to the, to the book today. I don't think I used the term diffusion at the time. I just referred to it as acceptance. Yeah. So the, the, uh, the, the book digs, takes a much deeper dive into let's use cognitive, uh, diffusion rather than cognitive restructuring. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's change the way we, we relate to our thoughts rather than try to change the content of our thoughts. Uh, so I, I, I think I, I, much, I make it much more explicit that I think gee, if you have trouble with cognitive restructuring, it's probably because that often doesn't work so well. Try this instead. Don't yeah. keep hammering at it. And so many times people have come in to see me and tell me they, they kind of feel like a failure because as hard as they tried, they couldn't correct all the errors of their thoughts. Yeah, yeah well, I can't either. I think it's important too in a workbook situation because the workbook is attached in many ways, that concept to some of the old school or sort of second wave thought restructuring and fact checking and thought records. And, you know, if you write them down, you can counter them with other thoughts. And I think the concept of a workbook does bring that up for a lot of people who especially have been through more traditional forms of CBT. Well, I tried a workbook. It didn't work. Again, he made me write down my thoughts and then challenge them. And it didn't matter because when I panicked, everything went out the window. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, the fact that you included that in and sort of walk people through that. And again, it's always examples that you can use. Think about a time that you thought this. Think about a time that how did you relate to that thought? How might you relate differently to the thought? So I think you did a really good job with that too. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, what, what I like to say about this is that this is not your, your grandfather's cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, <laughs> there's something very different here. 
That's very true. And I think uh, I'm not sure if your experience or, or your as you travel in these circles would bear this out. But I find that in certain parts of the world, especially, there is uh, there is a reliance on some of those older school techniques as basic training. And we'll get into basic training in a second, because you also make an admission in the book, which I think was fascinating. I want to come up, talk about, but uh, a reliance on some of those older school techniques. And no, that's CBT. That's how we treat this. And they've, been, they've never changed. So they're doing it the way they did it in 1998. And it has not changed. So kudos for bringing that up. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about control before we sort of wrap it up. I'm going to wrap it up with the putting on the spot, but we want to talk about control because you, you put a whole chapter in on control. And so many people will say, well, the problem, this is a control issue. Clearly I have control issues. Let, let's talk about it for a second. What, what are, what's your take on the whole idea that panic attacks and anxiety is a control issue, which I think has a very analytic bent to it. I have control issues. I'm a control freak. Yeah. I like the way you wrote about it comes up in so many ways and, and they're mostly, you know, self-critical and, and pejorative and, and make people feel bad. Um, I, I think one of the, the big throughways here is that uh, when people are struggling with panic attacks, they tend to think uh, that control is measured by what they feel emotionally uh, and physically and, and what their thoughts are. Uh, and then they feel out of control because they have these wild and wacky thoughts and they can't seem to make them shut up or go away. And they have the, the strong fears and emotions and they can't make that go away. And uh, one of the through lines I think to appreciate in this is that control is something we measure by behavior, by what you do with your hands and your feet. It's not about what thoughts you have. It's not about what, what feelings you have. Uh, we don't put somebody in jail because they had a thought about robbing a bank. We only put them in jail if they go in with a gun and rob the bank. Uh, control is about what you do and not about what you think and feel. And, and when you think of yourself as out of control because you're having nasty thoughts or, or strong negative emotions, it, it misleads you into taking a, a much more negative view of yourself than is warranted. Yeah, where it, interesting. You, when you give up that that idea of control, like I have to control what I feel, the outcome must be emotionally based or thought based. And start to realize, well, I could act a certain way. And believe it or not, I'm giving up control, but that gives me more control in the end. As it's a very everything about this is a paradox. There's almost yeah. nothing that makes perfect Controlling sense. Controlling what's important, what's more important. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. There you go. Like I can put my control in what I do, behavioral, lead with the behavior and the thoughts and the emotions will tend to follow behind that, which is also a hard ask, especially in the online mental health community where you hear the, those crazy, like change your thoughts, change your life, change your mindset, your mind, like, ah, this is so opposite. And it's so right. hard for somebody, somebody like Dave writing in this, I, I, let me at least acknowledge, it's very difficult to write in that direction because you're going against the grain, the popular grain, so. Well, and when, you, when you're struggling with panic attacks, that, that's the issue. You know, your natural instincts are gonna have you to go against the grain and, and, and you need all kinds of different ways to realize Oh, no, we're, we're going to do the opposite of that. I'm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the grain, not against the grain. It's great. And so you, you basically have written an entire, it's a very practical book. I mean, it is a workbook in the truest sense. I saw a, re, you know, a review copy of it, so I don't have the final layout. But there's places to write down your exercises and track your progress and, and answer the questions. So when Dave asks questions in the book, there are places where you could literally answer the questions right there in the book, which is great. Um, and it's going to walk you through all of that stuff, like why this is a trick and then what you can do about it, recognizing what you're already doing wrong, recognizing what you have to do to get better, making that plan, going through with it. And I, I keep bringing this back to this. If you guys are, have listened to the podcast, for you, this is going to sound very, very familiar. And I think it's this book is a great companion to what you're listening to here weekly. It really is. It fits perfectly. And when you ask, but how do I? Well, here's a book that will tell you. Here's how do I? So. Uh, I want to wrap it up with one little anecdote that you gave in the beginning of the book, which was early on in your career. And you, you relayed the story about somebody who came in and was unfortunate enough to have green Dave Carbonell right out of school <laughs> as their intake person. And that person asked, well, I have panic attacks. You know about those, right? And your answer had to be. Uh, not right. I well, guess I I, not, <laughs> yeah, I, I was an intern. This is a story when I was at, at the yeah. VA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this man was very upset and it, it, it turned out he had reason to be upset. They'd been, you know, putting him through the, the mill. He had missed a couple of sessions. So they made him go to the front of the line and start all over. And he was being punished for missing sessions. And his punishment was coming and talking to Dave. 
<laughs> and and he knew it. He, yeah. he says to me, well, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm asking him all these questions. Well, sir, what are they? You know, I'm having panic attacks. You know what they are, don't you? And I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I have to tell him the truth, but I really don't want to. And, well, no, I don't really know what a panic attack is. I mean, that was very early. Okay? You were still in school at the time, this, I take This is what, 1985. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Um, I think the illustration there is great because so many people are struggling to get through and you know, solve this problem. I hate to call it a problem that you solve, but nonetheless, they're, they're dealing with these issues and they feel like I can't find the right help. And in the end, even somebody with the credentials that you have and the reputation you have clearly well-respected in the community has spent a lifetime working on this stuff, doesn't always get spoon-fed this information in school. It wasn't like there was the panic attack class that taught you how to do Claire Week stuff and, you know, it just... There, there was nothing then, you know, there, there was nothing then really, it, 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 it's better today. Um, but even so, what, what you get in school is not what's going to let you uh, treat people and, and help them. Uh, everything I know about panic, I learned after I left school. Uh, very uh, I, I, I learned it all from my clients. So when we, when I tell people all the time, and all the people I collaborate say all the time, when you're looking for professional help, look for somebody who specializes in this particular issue. And that is a perfect example of why I think you have dedicated your life to just treating these particular disorders. And it shows that the, the breadth of experience that you get and the knowledge from the experience is what leads you to write a book like this. So. Well, and, and, and look, you know, look into that a little bit. If, if someone specializes in, and anxiety and 10 other things, well, they don't specialize in anxiety. Yeah, I say that all the time. <laughs> don't let your therapist or the potential to say, oh yeah, I do anxiety too. Like, no, not really. Yeah. Well done. I cannot recommend this book highly enough, The Panic Attacks Workbook. It is, this is the second edition, second edition, I take it? It is, yes. Very good. So if you are listening to the podcast, I will wrap this up. I will give you a link that you can go to where you can find that book, Amazon, all the places I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, and it'll be on my website too when it comes out. Very good. So if you go to the show notes for this episode, which I will tell you about in a minute when we wrap up and I'll put it up on the screen on YouTube, you'll find link to Dave's website and all of his stuff. Where, where can people find you if they, they just don't want to listen anymore? <laughs> What's the best place to find you online? <laughs> uh, anxietycoach.com. That, that would be where to find me. Very good. Uh, and I have, I have a fairly extensive website there with lots of self-help materials and links to Facebook and everything else are from there. So anxietycoach.com is, is my home. Yeah, there's a ton of free resources out there. You should check it out. So thank you very much, man. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for letting me read the book ahead of time. I appreciate that too. And yeah, I'm well, glad to do it. And then thanks for having me back. Always, always a pleasure to sit and talk. You're very welcome. We'll do it again sometime. All right, guys, hang on. And I will wrap this up and I'll give you on the links. Okay, we are back. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview as much as I enjoyed doing it. Uh, Dave is a good guy, always gracious enough to spend his time here to help us out on the podcast. And like I said, a bit of a legend in the anxiety community. So when I get to talk to people like that, uh, to me, it's kind of a special treat. Uh, so there you go. That is Dave's approach to panic attacks. It sounds very familiar. Again, if you're familiar with the podcast, I think his book, The Panic Attacks Workbook, is a great resource. You guys know that I don't just go willy nilly, you know, endorsing books and products and stuff like that. I never do that. But I did get to read it. And I think it is a great resource. So if you're interested in checking it out, you can hit my website at theanxioustruth.com slash 202. That will have the full show notes on this podcast, and I'll make sure to have a link over to Dave's book on Amazon. If you want to check it out, um, you'll more than welcome to do that. So that is it for episode 202, Dave Carbonell, Panic Attacks and the Panic Attacks Workbook. Thanks for coming by. You know it's over because music. This is, as always, Afterglow by Ben Drake. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Tell him I said hi if you go and check him out. Uh, and I will ask you, as I always do, if you are listening to this podcast on iTunes or Spotify or someplace that you can leave a review, leave a five-star review and write a little, I'm sorry, that would be a five-star rating and a little <laughs> excellent review. If you love the podcast, it helps other people find it. And that's why we do this to try and help as many people as possible. If you're watching on YouTube, certainly hit the subscribe button and like the video and all that stuff. Leave a comment. I'm happy to interact with you guys. And that is it. We will back, be back next week. As always, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to talk about, but I will be here. And remember, as always, this is the way. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance. So go and live your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push through the pressure like an atom bomb. Keep on
dancing like it's your last song. Makes no difference if you're right.